the meals fatigue ratio is the biggest game changer of the modern lifting world. Number one would have to be the weighted pull up. Easy choice, four or five bench. That's the ultimate bro achievement. Okay, so I want to kick things off by talking about your origin story, one that began as a teenager with calisthenics, watching YouTube fitness early with the Hodge twins, and training with the three assassinos. All of this led you to create the Alpha Destiny YouTube channel in 2013. Do you have a positive lasting memory from your first year on YouTube? I do when I don't, in the sense that I started the channel at a very young age, literally first year of Sejep, and I hadn't been lifting for that long. I had more calisthenics experience than being in the gym. So I had much to learn. My personality was not developed. Very awkward, gamer nerd. And so I came onto the scene with certain expectations of being like my heroes, but I didn't have the life experience or the character to properly convey my message. So it was very hard for me. And it actually took a whole year to even get a thousand subscribers. And it was discouraging because I didn't get many comments either. Of course, those who follow my stuff were very nice and we developed a, fr a friendship of sorts, but it was very tight and I was still a student. And honestly, I didn't really have a life at the time. I would wake up early, go to school, come back home, eat, go to the gym, film it, edit into the night on repeat. And uh, from that time frame all the way till 2016, I basically sacrificed everything. I didn't go out. I didn't hang out with many people. I was completely isolated. I didn't game. Uh, I was all into this lifestyle, trying to avoid working a job for one, but also following my passion. And so uh, that was the early stages, but things started to kick off when I hit around 5,000 followers. After that, it was just, uh, you know, you hit 10K, 20K, and then 70K, 100K, and it just started exploding from there on. But I did it the slow route, and I think it could have been faster had I been a little bit older. And at the time, I was also trying to hide my age because I felt like people weren't going to take me seriously being a very young man, and you could even see it. So that's why I tried to, you know, grow out a beard and do all these things to make myself appear more mature. And, you know, you, you put on a little bit of a shtick, but that's all, that's all the ramblings of a young man who doesn't know himself yet. So I had much to grow. I made a lot of mistakes, said a lot of stupid stuff, but my intentions were always pure to be like those who helped me, you know, be a part of the online fitness community. And that's what I did. But before that, uh, yeah, the, the three assassinos, <laughs> I did uh, calisthenics and parkour. That was like a three to four year journey. I don't recall exactly how long, but it was inspired by watching a lot of uh, fitness FAQs, Mechanic, Mechanimal, uh, Fortress, Hannibal for King, all the New York street guys, right? And I did their routines like around the world. That was my vibe, you know? Uh, Pull-ups, dips, then push-ups, just super set it, doing 10 plus sets, no problem. And what I can tell you is that the first day I ever stepped foot into a gym, I was already able to do 15 muscle ups. Wow. And yeah, some guys will never get that. For me, this is day one. And the same thing with weighted pull ups, hitting a plate, no problem. Dips were already over a plate because I was able to do 50 body weight. So imagine first day in the gym, this is my starting point. And that was built through calisthenics, not even doing it right. You know, just high rep circuit style stuff. And calisthenics basically took me from 120 pounds because I'll say this. I stopped growing at 15 years old. So anyone who says it was just puberty, it wasn't, you know, I'm a short guy. My frame has been the same forever. Okay. So I come in 120, maybe 12% body fat, always had abs, do calisthenics for three to four years with my buddies, Alessandro, Carlos, and Biebs. Actually, we were four at the end doing some running every morning as well. Got myself fit, built up my work capacity, was doing track and field, swimming, all that good stuff. A little bit of MMA. And then I bulked from basically 120 to 143. So I, I put on some good muscle with calisthenics. Go to the gym. Eight months later, I'm an intermediate lifter. Benching two plates for reps, deadlifting three plates for reps, squat, same thing. They were actually equal at the time. I'm not built for the deadlift. 
and uh, I bulked up to 167. So from 143 to 167, still a similar body fat. And then from there on, it's been a slow grind, uh, bulking to the 180s, you know, playing in that bear mode range and, uh, you know, just showing people how to actually build a body the proper way, naturally with the intention of long-term health. So I know that's a bit of a ramble. I'm all over the place here. My apologies, but I've always been passionate about this game and I wanted to be a fitness influencer uh, very early on. I was going to say that you mentioned that, you know, you didn't feel like there was too much positive in the first year and it was kind of a grind and, you know, you did things alone and you weren't going out. But I imagine that there was some sort of burning desire kind of in the back there that was leading you to those actions. And I guess, yes, a belief in yourself that if you kept grinding at it and learning and improving that, that things would work out. Yeah, because... I was so young. I, I knew that part of it was my lack of life experience and that I just had to stay on course. And I was also reading a lot of self-improvement books. So it would take me an hour and a half to go to school every day. And I would take uh, the bus and subway, right? And so what I did was listen to audiobooks or more commonly read self-help books. And I would quite literally go through one to two books a week, usually one, two is a stretch. But that's what it was. And sometimes I would even wake up a little bit earlier if I was really tired, uh, read for like half an hour and then go on the bus. And I would just nap, you know, because some of those days I was only sleeping four to six hours. You know, I still make gains, by the way. You you work with what you got. Right. Oh, and I forgot to tell you this. I even I even ditched some dates to go to the gym. So. And then my, to work out with my buddy, because I promised him we're going to do this workout. But then come around when the same thing would happen to him, he ditches me. So it's like, hey, you, you didn't choose the bro. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I knew that it was a matter of time. And I'm reading all these books. It's motivating me. I'm listening to you know, seminars. I'm in the library at school. So I just want you to, I was obsessed with this, right? I'm reading in the morning, I'm reading on the way back from school, and when I'm at the library, if I'm not doing uh, work for my assignments and stuff like that, I'm watching videos. Like I remember being in the library with my head headphones on or earbuds, I'm listening to Steve Shaw, you know? Like I'm, I'm just binge watching all their content. So instead of like being at home, just wasting away, whenever I had the opportunity, straight to YouTube Fitness. And it's like, I still do that to this day, you know? When I'm going for a run, I'm listening to a podcast. I am completely obsessed with self-improvement. Uh, there's not a, a day that I don't learn something. So just with that mindset, I knew that it was a matter of time. And I couldn't stop. And I was too motivated not to. Like even I used to read a lot of uh, Bold and Determined back in the day. And uh, Victor convinced me that uh, you want to have, you know, you want to be self-sufficient. I, I like totally he painted a bad picture of uh, the alternative. Like he scared that he scared the hell out of me <laughs> at a young age. I can totally relate to that on the self improvement side of things. I think when I was in my late teens, early twenties, I came across a book at a library here. It's like a Napoleon Hill book it's called Law yeah. of Success. Law of Success. I read I, that too. I read that, that book first in the library in four days. It's like seven hundred pages, and I'm not like studious. A I'm not a book, reader. Man. I just crushed through it. I got really excited. Uh, I made a vision board. I was just all about that stuff. I still chilled and stuff, but I definitely would like, I was never at home. So if people weren't hanging, I'd be like, I'm at the library, come link up with me at the library and then we'll go out. So I would just go there and read and focus on self-improvement. Do any books stick out for you that maybe impacted you at that time? The one that impacted me the most is, well, Law of Success was a big one. So it's funny that you mentioned that because I found it was even better than Think and Grow Rich because that's the complete work of Napoleon Hill. Like it's it's unbeatable. Very long book though. I'm surprised he did it in four days. It took me like three months to finish that, you know? But this four, is just- four, four days to read, but not probably four days to comprehend. <laughs> True. So uh, Law of Success, uh, Think and Grow Rich by Dale Carnegie, The Magic of Thinking Big. And believe it or not, even uh, Anthony Robbins, uh, his first book, it wasn't Awaken the Giant Within. It was, 
forget what it was called. The power of something. Yeah. Uh, those were like the big three, big four, whatever. Yeah. Um, but it was, man, I have a whole library of books that I can go through, but they were all kind of saying the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's more so the lessons that I took on rather than this specific book. Yeah, that makes sense. The self-improvement and mindset stuff, it's, it's really interesting because I think a lot of people get into it, but then they are not able to apply it in the real world. And then they get trapped in the yeah. self-improvement trap as well. So you got to be yeah. aware, am I actually getting benefit and applying this benefit yes. in my life yeah. and improving myself? Or am I just becoming a self-improvement junkie who it, is using yeah. it as entertainment? We, we call that action faking. And that's the other book I forgot about, The Millionaire Fastlane. That was the one entrepreneurship book that did it for me. If you okay. haven't read it, you must. I haven't. Okay. MJ DeMarco All even right. has the Fastlane form. You, you can't go wrong with his work. So, yeah, basically people, they read all these books and then they never apply it, right? In my case, though, it was very relevant because I was making YouTube videos on a frequent basis and just living the, like I didn't have a choice. Like, and I burned that bridge early on. Like I knew that I was going to be working online, that I was never going to have a job. And that's what I've manifested. So for me, it was a necessity that I apply this stuff right away. And you're always getting instant feedback. Also, when you film yourself, you learn things about your tics. It's very uh, different from having a conversation with someone because the camera doesn't give you feedback. So everything has to come from you. You have to be creative. Think before you speak. You know, pay attention to your diction, your pauses, the way you look, all that stuff. It's uh, really an art, you know, but some guys, they get it naturally. For me, I was extremely introverted. So uh, it took some time to hone in on that skill. Awesome. All right, I'm moving in a different direction here. I know we talked about calisthenics and something yes. you've advocated and progressed for years is weighted calisthenics. So I know you've said... You don't like to do, you know, top rankings sometimes because there can always be different variations that can be more appropriate under different circumstances. But with that being said, what are your Mount Rushmore, your top four favorite weighted calisthenics exercises in the lens of hypertrophy, a measure of success, or that you just enjoy it? Okay. Well, I'm a simple guy, so I'm just going to give you <laughs> what works best. Number one would have to be the weighted pull-up medium grip, or even if people have access to it, the semi supinated weighted chin up. So rather than being on a straight bar, you're slightly angled yeah. like an easy bar. Some oh. pull-up bars have this, uh, most don't, but I really love that variation. And you can actually create it yourself by buying specific uh, attachments, you know? So that's it's if you want to, yeah. exactly. If you want to fix implement, otherwise the weighted ring chin would be a close second. Only issue is, you often can't get the best stretch in the bottom because the loading pin will hit the floor. So you need to use a very shorter, like a shorter one or a chain, but that can cause the place to swing a bit. So, you know, you can't go wrong with a regular bar weighted pull up chin up variation. Secondly, weighted dip just for the loading potential. It is a street lifting competition movement. And by the way, both are pull ups and dips. You can overload it to the max infinite uh, potential for progression. The stability is there, contrary to what some optimal bros like to say, because otherwise we wouldn't have guys dipping 400 pounds, which we're yeah. now seeing. So that closes the entire debate. And you've seen me do 255 on the way to dip, 225 for sets of five. Uh, that, that's if you look at the total number, that's over 400 pounds for reps. Yeah. So this idea that you can't recruit a high threshold motor units just baffles me to no end. But anyway, the way to dip has to be the best press. It has the, the greatest carryover to lifting as well. It's standardized in a sense. And um, it just makes the most, it's, it's just practical when you're trying to load it. Because uh, the third exercise would actually be the deficit way to push up. Love where, that. oh my God. Uh, it's funny because I thought that I had created it, but it looks like Vince Gironda already figured it out in the 70s. He called it the fulcrum push up. Okay. <laughs> so it involves having, uh, your hands on parallettes or two plyometric boxes or stall mats. And then the feet are on a matching height. So it could be a flat bench. It could be another plyometric box. And then you simply wear a backpack to get the loading in. And I prefer this over wearing a dip belt on my chest because, again, 
the plates will hit the floor. You can't get a full stretch. So the whole point is to get your arm all the way down, like a camber bar bench press. And so you're saving space. It's uh, an exercise where you're moving through space. So the carryover to calisthenics will be there. It builds watermelon pecs. It carry, it, it'll strengthen your dip as well. It doesn't cause sternum pain or shoulder pain. It's a flat angle as opposed to a slight decline, which your dip puts you in. So you're, you're getting the opposing movement on that as well. You can even decline it ever so slightly. Uh, and when I say decline, by the way, it can be confusing with calisthenics because a decline push-up is like an incline bench press. You yeah. Know? But that's what I'm saying. The feet are elevated, right? So that's working the upper chest. But all variations of deficit push-ups are amazing. Better than doing it off the floor and for getting more out of less weight. Because keep in mind, you don't want to rip your backpack either, right? So if you got like 100 to 150 pounds in there, that's more than enough. But if you're doing it off the floor and you're a strong guy, you might need 200 pounds. If you're like in a low rep range, you know? So that's my number three. And number four, it's a very tricky one. Because like how... But I would I would probably have to say that the thing is the only you don't even need to weigh this down. It's probably the deficit handstand push-up. Okay. That is your overhead press replacement. It'll build cannonball delts. If you can rep these out, you can instantly overhead press your body weight. That's actually one of the secrets that Doug Hepburn and Paul Anderson use. And these guys were 300 pounds doing this. So that's freaky strength. And Doug, I believe, was the first man to bench 500. So it'll strength, it'll keep your shoulders healthy. It'll strengthen your overhead press. It carries over to your dips and push-ups. It's hard as hell. You don't need to weigh it down. That's an S-tier lift. You know? And if you do it with the wall support, you're just gliding. So there's no skill or stability demand. You know. But uh, those are my top. Otherwise, in last place, I would put the weighted inverted row. Because uh, it's nice to have a rowing movement for the upper back. You can't just do pull-ups if you want optimal gains, you know? So in, in the calisthenics context, that's going to be the best one. And I like doing it with uh, the Kenzui weight vest or a backpack. So the plates are over here. And just to clarify, some guys are going to say, well, why would you not wear the backpack the other way? So that you can get more range of motion at the top. And my response would be that most free-weighted back movements are short and biased by design. So it's not a lever-based row, like a T-bar row or a prime machine, right? And so the top is, is a natural sticking point that is not even the most hypertrophic part of the lift. It's really the stretch. And so if you cut out the range of motion by a couple inches, which the backpack will naturally do, assuming you're rowing from a straight bar or a football bar, whatever, it's fine in this context. Otherwise, I would also say that the ring variant cuts out this so-called problem okay. to begin with. So you can pull through the body and everything's fine. So those are your main mass builders in a calisthenics context. Uh, there's all kinds of other variations I could share. I can go on for days about it, but <laughs> you, you'll, you'll build a good physique with just that. For the upper body base. <laughs> so I think the, the weighted chin is probably my favorite overall exercise. Um, oh, yeah. One thing is I always have done it like chest to bar. Do you think that's the appropriate range of motion? Or do you think it's better maybe doing actually a smaller range of motion because, you know, that's kind of the shortened position? I, I think chest to bar is amazing. The only problem is you might think that you're hitting failure, but it's just a sticking point. And so what you can do is... Test the bar until it's no longer possible, and then just rep it out, chin over the bar. And that, but the thing is, you're going to limit the load by doing that. And so, I'd only recommend this to someone who's already very strong weighted chins. So, my standard would be at least two plates for four to six reps. If you're doing that, then you're yeah. eligible for chest the bar. You know, the same thing for the super wides, the behind the neck. We do these extreme variations because we're trying to minimize fatigue. So that we can do more volume on the work that comes after, you know, or maybe we're doing this as a back offset. So like what I always do is I'll open up with a heavy weighted chin up variation, you know, so three, four plates, whatever the weight may be. And then I'll do some back down sets with that. So strip off a plate and then I'll actually do another pull up variation, but it's going to be body weight only. So it's either going to be super wide 
behind the neck, or like you said, chest to bar, sternum style. And because you're fatigued, you won't get as many reps. You might get 12 to 15. And that's great. There's no need to go very heavy on this. And then you can do a mechanical drop set, just bringing your chin to the bar or whatever. But I think the default, there's a sweet, there's a sweet spot. And when we talk about going all the way down like that, I mean, you got to earn that right. So, I mean, if you're able, props to you. But I think the average person is better off standardizing the ROM a little bit lower, especially given that sticking point, like you just mentioned. I'm able, but I feel like I'm at a point now where maybe I'm not progressing as fast as I could if I just decrease the range yeah. of motion. Um, I'm not going to say I've plateaued. It's just... Uh, keep in mind... It's taking time now. Yeah, keep in mind, right? The strength that you develop on the top end part of a chin-up, it radiates 15 degrees in all directions. So what I'm saying is, if you bring your chin directly to the bar, that will improve your strength slightly below and slightly above. Okay. So that's how the strength carryover works. And so if you're doing chest to bar, right, obviously that's going to help you here and even lower. It does that as well. But that also means that if you're just bringing your chin to the bar, it's still going to help you get it over. Okay. And so that's why it's smart to mix in a variety of ranges just to you know, maximize your strength development. Because we're talking about a, a free weighted mover where you can't really change the strength curve. So you have to do it through range of motion manipulation. Yeah. And it does work. It minimizes overuse injuries, which is very important. And it gets you strong at every position. And keep in mind, when you change your grip width, that too affects the uh, joint angle stress. So for example, if I'm doing a wide grip chin, me just getting my chin to the bar is equivalent to using a medium grip and getting my chin over the bar in terms yeah. of the stress that I feel when I'm bending my arm. So that's why it's fine. It, it doesn't have to be like, like every rep is slightly above the bar. You can have some deviation. Cool. Awesome. Uh, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw out some fitness topics. Tell me if you think it's overrated, underrated, or fairly rated. Okay. All right. First one is stimulus to fatigue ratio. Underrated. Why? Stimulus fatigue ratio is the biggest the biggest game changer of the modern lifting world. Anyone who's strong will attest that it allows you to become so much stronger and not feel as beat up. Thinking about SFR, allow me to deadlift 600 pounds without even deadlifting. Because I have a benchers build. And whenever I would pull from the floor for a lot of sets or even very minimal volume, I would have an insanely difficult time recovering because the absolute load in addition to my leverages just didn't allow me to recover. But when I discovered good mornings, everything changed. I was now able to get the same stimulus to my posterior chain with quite literally a fraction of the load. So instead of doing 500 pound deadlifts for reps, I could be doing good mornings with 225 for reps and my glutes, hamstrings, and spinal rectors got the same stimulus. I know that's difficult for people to believe, but they just need to try it and will understand that you're lengthening the moment arm. So it's not about weight on the bar. It's about load magnification. It's the same thing when we talk about the sissy squat. You can have a guy who can barbell squat 500 pounds and he has trouble sissy squatting 70 pounds, which is actually what I was doing, by the way. So, or someone who, for example, um, is doing reverse Nordic curls. And, you know, they can also squat big weights. So there's all kinds of examples I can share, but just favoring good mornings finally turned me into an elite deadlifter. And this extends to the bench press as well, introducing the Larson press for that 10% weight reduction. Mm -hmm. uh, squats, we're talking about the SSB. Another layer is reversing it. You know, it's the same stimulus. Like people get so wrapped up with how heavy they're going but at the end of the day it's about motor unit recruitment and being in a rep range that limits fatigue so if, if you're lifting in let's say the five to eight rep range it doesn't matter if it's uh like an overloading variation or more out of less weight variation if you're training with sufficient intensity and you're progressively getting stronger the gains will be comparable you know uh and then there's also the fact that what if some workout days you aren't feeling 100 or you yeah. want to, uh, you want some variation that's not 
high specificity, which also beats you up. Well, that's where you have a day where you're doing the overloading variations and another where it's self-limiting. So maybe on Monday, for example, you could be doing low bar squats. And then on Thursday, uh, high bar or SSB. So you blend your system like that, you know, or you just go all in on the more or less weight stuff. If you're a really strong guy, what we find is that in a hypertrophy context, that's usually how it plays out. Like you'll see guys, they get very strong on the heaviest variations and then you see them backing off. They just go, they switch to, you know, more tempo work. Like for example, uh, Dr. Mike Isratel, you'll see him doing incline dumbbell presses with 85 pounds. You know, when I worked out with him, he stripped me from 120 to 65, which is a, a massive difference. But we're talking about a slow centric, bringing the dumbbells past the armpits because a lot of guys will just touch here, right? But you can actually go further out. So yeah. it's almost like a dumbbell press hybrid, right? A dumbbell fly hybrid. And so these hacks work, but they work for people who need that extra recovery. Because when you're a beginner, you have a motor unit recruitment deficit. You're not able, first of all, you haven't mastered the movement patterns. So there's a skill component, which is affecting your, your, your force production and some reps you might misgroove. And then there's just the fact that you're untrained. The weight is just so light that nothing really fatigues you. But when you got some years under your belt, like every time I got a bench, when I'm not cutting, that is, it's minimum 315. I don't have a choice. Like yeah. even if my first set, I go to failure, we're talking 10 reps here. That means that the next set is going to be six reps at least. And the third set, let's say I'm really like done, right? I'm still going to get four reps, but that still counts for the hypertrophy rep range. And so I'm in a situation where I'm benching three plates every single workout, and that kills you. The same thing for the overhead press. If you're doing over 200 for reps and you weigh 180, that's a lot of stress on your body. And so, you know, even the extensions of all things, you're doing 60 pound dumbbell extensions, that's harder on the elbows. So if you can find variations that are less tough on the joints, that give you the same hypertrophy stimulus, and still going to get you strong because at the end of the day, your muscle mass is a large correlator of strength in the long term, then why would you not opt for those variations? Is, is that stimulus that fatigue? is very relevant for those who need it. I was going to say, is that especially important if you're doing a serious cut while your recovery might not be as well? Oh, yeah, for sure. Because uh, that's where a lot of injuries come in, like pec tears, you know? But I would also say it's more applicable to enhanced lifters. Because I actually proved it this year that not only could you max out on a cut, but you can also do it that single-digit body fat and twice a week, which I thought was impossible because the last time I had done that was in 2021 when I was trying to build up my bench press. But this year I was doing double max effort on weighted dips, which are even more dangerous than the bench and weighted pull-ups. And yet I got no shoulder injuries, no pec injuries, no golfer's elbow, none of that. So, but what was I doing? Self-limiting variations. I was doing pause weighted dips. I was doing weighted dips with chains. I was doing a uh, super wide chin, super close. The only time you do the regular variation is for testing purposes. You're not going to train like that every single workout. So that's what I would say in a strength training context, if you're still trying to maintain on the way down. All right. Next one is uh, optimal biomechanics. I would say it's a mixed bag. I, I could, my, my default answer would be overrated because I think, What's most important is progressive overload. And at the end of the day, if these exercises are superior, it's by a very small amount. We're talking 5 to 10%. Okay. So those who benefit most are probably going to be advanced bodybuilders who are searching for that final edge. And a lot of times it happens to be uh, joint friendly as well. So it goes back to the topic of stimulus to fatigue. But I don't think there's anything magical about these movements. And at the end of the day, I'm still not seeing that much of an improvement in the natural bodybuilding scene compared to the 40s, 50s, and yeah. even 60s. Like, look at the silver era and see if the top natties today are matching those physiques. And for the most part, I would say, no, they're not. Like, do you, do you see guys who look like Leroy Colbert? You know, even Steve Reeves, which is way back, is still considered the pinnacle of aesthetics. Or Reg Park, for example. Guys will debate his natty status, but... Look, I'll believe it, you know, or Marvin Eater, 
He benched yeah. 500 pounds as a lightweight. I mean, you, you just got, you know, Marvin Wells. There were some sick physiques. And, of course, they could have, you know, improved a little bit more, too. They had very limited equipment, but it didn't necessarily have to be through optimal movements, quote-unquote. And so I, I don't think, you know, the bar has been raised that much with this. And, uh, you know, I guess time will tell. But, you know, it's still important to learn these concepts because we can also apply them in a classical uh, context. What I mean is, like, I actually bought a biomechanics course. Uh, I was alluding to this some years back, but, uh, you know, Coach Kasim, N1 Education, yep. I decided to purchase his biomechanics course because I wanted to learn the material, you know? So I'm not opposed to it. I will put my money where my mouth is. I want to know all this stuff. But even with that, I still don't think that it's going to be the game changer. Just that it can help me not get injured and apply those concepts to even calisthenics, for example. Like if I know that, let's talk about the lats real quick, that you can leverage the rib cage by bringing the arm slightly in instead of just doing a pull like this. And that, you know, I can get a better squeeze if I'm, you know, if I'm not using a restrictive bar, like a little V handle. Well, can't I not get that effect with gymnastic rings? Like logically, I can do an archer ring chin up. So I'm coming out, mm -hmm. right? And then in over here. Or I could even, uh, just by me doing a regular ring chin, at the top, your, your arms are stretched inwards. And as you pull down, they're coming out. So there's an in and out motion. So I am leveraging the rib cage, you know? Or if I do a, a ghetto lat pull down, which is one of my signature moves nowadays, where I have the legs up on the power rack, now I have spinal flexion. So I'm fully lengthening the lower lats, which would be the same thing if I'm doing an L-sit pull up, the same if I'm doing a rack chin, right? And if I go, if I use the spreader bar, same thing. It's coming in and out. So I didn't have to do an iliac pull down to get those benefits, even though I recognize the benefits. It, it makes sense when you, you know, when you analyze the movement pattern, what's being hit, but I can still target those same muscles. I can hit yep. the lower lats. I can bias because I understand the concepts. So that's what I'm trying to say. Um, you know, let's say people say that you can get a better stretch on your pecs by leveraging the rib cage by coming down here instead of out there. Well, I have a barbell called the Arch Nemesis Bar by Bells of Steel. So I have neutral handles and it has a camber. So now I get the full way to stretch on the pecs. I have the stability of the bar. And yes, bars are stable enough. I don't know why people keep saying that it's not. These, these guys are actually insane. Uh, and I can leverage the rib cage. So it's like, yeah. you know, you learn the concepts. Same with the, the anterior delt press. You know, uh, I, I can go on, but if you know what you're hitting, you can bias with calisthenics, you can bias with barbells, you can bias with dumbbells. You don't have to line up everything perfectly with a cable or do some of these novel movements. You know, some of the old school stuff is biomechanically sound as well. And there's degrees to this. And Coach Kasim will also agree that uh, an exercise just needs to be biased enough. And the way that I look at it is, does it have progression potential? Above all else, you must have that. If you don't, then I don't care how lined up you are. It's not going to be the best in the long term. Like, even though, for example, I love one-arm pushdowns because they feel great on the elbows. It hits the long head in the short position. You know, there's no spreading force required. You're not going to tell me that that's a better mass builder than a close grip bench press. And th this is coming as someone who is not a minimalist and didn't get the biggest arms by doing that. But I can still acknowledge that it's a better mass builder, you know, or uh, a skull crusher with dumbbells, for example. I'd rather do that, you know. Uh, so the ability to progress in the long term is more important than having every biomechanical factor be present. Awesome. All right, so now I'm going to throw out some quotes you said, and this is really relevant to what we just talked about. Uh, so here's the first one. I have a problem with people who regurgitate people's concepts without the nuance. An example would be Coach Casa and people copy and paste from him. They do. They're, they're complete douchebags. And uh, they should be disgusted in, in their behavior because they made him look really bad. You know, because when I rant about 
the optimal stuff in biomechanics. I'm never ranting about Cassim. Like I just told you, I bought his course. I've been following him since 2020. And I respect the man a lot. And everything he says makes complete sense. You know, there's a lot of other natural bodybuilders who are in agreement with his work. But there's a lot of people who go on his page and they'll just steal an exercise. They'll never give him credit, by the way. And they'll butcher the exercise and give explanations that are extremely one-dimensional. So it's like you're going to the source and you're not even doing it properly. And then unfortunately, because these guys often have aesthetic physiques, which you didn't even build with these movements, by the way, but they're young, they're enthusiastic, you know, they're playing a certain way, or maybe they're putting it on TikTok, which they're going to attract a, a younger audience. You now have a bunch of noobs doing this without a base, performing it wrong, and then re and then they start regurg regurgitating it as well. And now you have a whole community of guys spewing nonsense. And then Kasim has to come in and correct what they're saying. And then, of course, when I get sent this stuff, I'm getting sent the watered down crappy version. Of course. And that's what I have to debunk. I'm not debunking Kasim. I'm debunking the extreme nonsense. So I do have a problem with that. You know, the guys who do it well, okay, would be uh, Jeff Nippard and Jeremy FDA. Okay. If you look on their YouTube videos, they always, they credit Kasim for one. And they say what he's saying with context, you know? Yeah. So... Yeah, that's not, not much it, else needs to be said. Yeah, it's it's a <laughs> thing. It drives me crazy, not just in fitness, but like in finance, like people will quote Warren Buffett and say things he's saying, but it's not even close to what he's actually saying. And it's just oh, yeah. like in a 30 second TikTok and it drives me crazy because my uh, like BS meter is really good in that space as yours is in the fitness space. So you see it right away. A hundred percent, you know? All right, next next one here. You have to be in a constant state of getting new information about your niche because that's what's going to unlock something in your brain to make that new video. Yeah, as a content creator, uh, things get stale and there's only so many things you could talk about in fitness, right? And that's why if you're only marrying yourself to one philosophy, like for example, oh, I am a, uh, a linear periodized powerlifter. That's all I do. Well, after about 100 videos or so, Mm, you don't really have much else to talk about. And so the only way you can make content is by, I guess, teasing to your coaching business or just doing Q and A's here and there, but it's going to be very repetitive and you stifle your own growth, right? So my approach is not only to be a hybrid lifter for my own personal satisfaction, because I want to be healthy. I want to excel at calisthenics, powerlifting, bodybuilding, all that. But at the same time, I'd like to give back to the community in the most complete way possible, because we all have different goals. And I don't want to just be one guy who does one thing. And so that's on a personal note. But I would say that in general, the moment you stop learning is the moment your fitness career starts to stagnate or eventually die. You can't afford that, especially when there's new studies coming out, there's new training concepts being discussed. And, you know, people are having these discussions. You don't want to be living in the past, even though we can learn from the past and apply some of the old school lessons, but it should be done. So in a modern context, including the way you make your videos, those old days where you're just filming with a webcam or a crappy phone or whatever, and just talking and it's just your head zoomed in like this, that's not going to fly. So you have to pay attention to what other people are doing. And it is your duty to deliver your message in the clearest and most professional way possible, because your, your competitors will do that. And oftentimes they might not have the best intentions at heart. So you got to one up them or at least match them by spreading the truth and doing it in a way that's digestible for this modern generation of lifters, you know, and they could be around your age. They could be younger, older. It doesn't matter. You need to get with the times and learning is a forever journey. You know, like if I was still making content like I did in 2017, my channel would have died off a long time ago. Like how many times am I going to discuss you know, power shrugs and rock poles and stuff like that. Right. But you see now that I've embraced different things like the plant-based diet that gives me opportunities to discuss how to get shredded with it or, you know, how to die for longevity, stuff like that. Right. Or, you know, me learning about calisthenics. I, okay. Me learning about biomechanics, perfect example. That's now true. I can apply that to calisthenics and I'm one of the first guys who's done this on YouTube, you know, or me learning about the conjugate system. I can apply it to Stuff that's not just powerlifting. 
So learning needs to be every day. And that's why if you're a fitness creator or any, whatever field you're in, you need to be subscribed to the guys who are also covering those topics. See what they're saying and, you know, build upon the discussion. It, it is a community after all, especially in the natural scene. You know, I guess that's the only niche thing about it, that everyone kind of knows each other, but we also know what we're talking about. So we're just yeah. building on those topics. Yeah, I actually feel like something you have a real talent for is combining multiple concepts and turning it into a new philosophy. I don't think that's a skill <laughs> everyone has, but it seems like how you just mentioned biomechanics and how you can apply it to calisthenics how the information probably existed before and you kind of combined it all into bear mode. So yeah, can you talk through that. Like, is that something that just comes naturally or is that in a skill that you've evolved over time? Hmm. I think I've always been that way. Um, I'm not going to toot my own horn here, but it's probably, it probably has to do with intelligence or crazy creativeness. One of those two, like I, I'm very, I'm introverted. So I'm in my head a lot. I'm constantly thinking and because I'm obsessed with learning and this is my passion, it's, it's easy for me to combine those concepts. Um, I, I don't really know what to say about it, to be honest with you. It's not, yeah, that's it cool. just, it just happens. Like it's my, just my brain, I get these cool. ideas. They just, let's, let's try this out. Like the first thing I'm like, when I learn something, my immediate reaction is how can I apply this right away? You know, I have a notebook, I write it out. And I'm already experimenting and I got this home gym right here. So I could be, I could be thinking of something on the computer and then, Oh, I got to try this, you know? And then I, I line things up and I'm like, Oh yeah, that makes sense. So I get it. I have a similar automatic. situation and it, it drives my family crazy. Like I could be watching a movie and then in that <laughs> movie, there's something weird, like in the sci-fi and I'm like, I could apply that to my startup. Let me try that out. Sure. And yeah. Like, can you like turn that brain off? And I'm like, I don't know how, like I've, I'm yeah. trying here. We're watching a movie, but like I got this idea and then I have that spark. And when I have that spark, I need to act on it right act away it. or it's gone. You have to. Like I it's agree. gone the next day. Like I got to do it right then and there. So I'll tell my wife, like, I know it's 11. Mm -hmm. I know we're watching TV. I'm going to go up. I'll be around tomorrow. But like, I got something here. Hey. I got to go for it now. I'm exactly the same way. And it, it's the vibe, man. You got to catch it in that moment. And the same thing for making videos. Like if I'm ready to make that video now and I get disturbed and it's in that, like now it's an hour that's passed, I'm not making that vid. I, I lost a chance. I, mean, I, I could still do it and it would come out informative, but the vibe is not going to be there. The passion, the way I explain myself, the, the tone, all that, you know, the, the flow, See, you know, just all the of flow, it. Yeah. Together. For sure. For sure. All right. I got one more quote here. Uh, what you want is moderate caloric restriction in an environment of micronutrient <laughs> excellence that's one of my favorite quotes but i'm sorry to say this Varun, but it's not my quote i know it's not it's by <laughs> it's by dr Furman, <laughs> and he, he's actually he said it so many times that he's even uh, modified so now he says what you desire is caloric restriction with the micronutrient adequacy adequacy he has very he has like three different variations of saying that quote you know but i, I love the original one um, basically what we're talking about here is getting the biggest caloric bang for your buck while at the same time having foods that are rich in micronutrients such that you're getting the best nutrition for the least amount of calories. So you're not suffering any nutritional deficiencies, but at the same time, you're slowing down the aging process and it's easier for you to stay leaner year round. Uh, so it's foods that have phytochemicals in them. So by 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 definition, you're going to be eating plant-based. They have more fiber. You know, they're rich in a lot of vitamins and minerals, but they're just not that high in calories. And you can just pile a bunch of them. You can stuff your face. And by the end of the day, like you're either in a deficit or at maintenance, but you got way more nutrition than someone who's just eating processed stuff. And they got more calories than you, yet you got more nutrition. So it's about hypernourishment. That's the best way I would describe it. So someone consuming even like 2,000 calories of a plant of like rich plant foods will be better nourished than someone having 3,000 calories of junk. And I would even say that there's degrees to healthy eating as well. If I'm on the absolute healthiest diet, I can outdo you with 500 calories less, you know? Because they're not all equal. There's levels to this. 
And what Dr. Furman always says is that, for example, with the blue zones, uh, we can actually do better than them. And his, his approach to nutritarian diet, it's, it's very extreme. Like he factors in every micronutrient imaginable to the point where it's like he won't even advocate consuming rice because there's better wow. carbs to have. And I would agree in that sense. Like if you're only consuming sweet potatoes, I mean, that, that makes more sense compared to having white rice. You could sure. have rice. It's not going to harm you. But why would you not opt for the option that has more micronutrients? Everything is a substitution of sorts, you know? Or it's like if you're going to have a dark leafy green, have the one that has the most, you know, that releases the most nitric oxide. Like have favorite arugula instead of spinach. Interesting. Don't just go for the boring options, you know? They're, they're not all equal. Not all the vegetables are the same. Mm. Dr. Gregor says it too. Choose sweet potato over white potato. Or uh, if you can get it purple, that's even better than orange. You know, have a diversity of, you know, micronutrient-rich foods. Don't just have one berry. Have them all. And, uh, you know, just you got you to think about your health when it comes to this. I think what I liked about the quote is it's it's implying like high volume food, but it's not forcing high volume food because I've kind of fallen yeah. in that trap before where it's like I'm not eating avocado because it's like too caloric dense. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I should probably eat some avocado because I like it and it's tasty and it's micronutrient dense. Like just kind yeah. of changing that framing slightly. I, I like. Yeah. That well, there's a there's a ratio for that, too, because there's, there's different varieties of a plant based diet. Um, what Dr. Furman advises is 15 to 20% fat and protein. And then the rest of the calories coming from carbs. Okay. Uh, and and it, that's probably the most complete way of doing it. Such that you don't end up with any deficiencies. It's very precise, you know, so he'll recommend about an ounce and a half a day of uh, nuts and seeds. So you're getting your fat in, you're getting some of the minerals and absorption benefits of that. Uh, he recommends a, an algae based omega three supplement as well just in case. And then uh, the rest is coming from whole carbs. So he's not going to advocate the uh, white rice and bagels and stuff like that. You know, it's going to be only unprocessed, you know, micronutrient rich var variations. Um, then he has this thing called the G bombs. So the greens, beans, onions, mushrooms, berries, and seeds, you know, okay. want to have that every single day. And what you find is like, even on, because I did this recently during my cut, even on 1800 calories, when you plug it into macro factor or chronometer or my fitness pal, what have you, you're like, you're in a surplus of all the micronutrients. Like it's not an exaggeration. You're, you're higher than if you're eating a normal diet. It's, it's actually mind blowing. Like there were some days that I was getting between 80 and 120 grams of fiber a day on 1800 calories. How is that possible? The only way you could do it is by eating these micronutrient rich yeah. foods and you're stuffing it in and it just comes naturally because you know, a lot of it can, is just water and it's, it's not, you know, it's not dense in that way. So awesome. Yeah. Cool. All right. So I'm going to go back to lifting here. I want you to rank these from the one you're least proud of to the one you're most proud of. Sure. Four or five bench press, 230 <laughs> weighted dip, 180 weighted pull up and 242 seated overhead press. Easy choice. Four or five bench. That's the ultimate bro achievement you know uh, the other ones came a lot easier okay. uh but the seated the seated overhead press wasn't that hard to do actually and the weighted chin it was just time you know mm -hmm. but the four or five bench you really got to know what you're doing like a lot of guys that's their deadlift one or max you know and it took me years and years of specialization to the point of even neglecting legs at times you know uh, doing double max effort, perfecting the conjugate system. It's it's not easy to do that at 185 pounds being a non power lifter. Like it's, I know that you see on social media, a lot of guys are hitting it now, but it's a very rare feat of strength. And if I was born way back, you know, if I would have been a silver era bodybuilder, you know, people would have been freaking out. So I definitely don't see it at my gym. <laughs> you'll almost never see it on a natural it's hard. It's really, and like, you're just, you're ready for that day and that's it. I did everything to the best of my abilities. You know, it was a hell of a grind. 
years and years and years, that'll always be the most impressive achievement. Would, it beats anything be, I've done. Would you be as proud if it came easier? Or do you think it's the the struggle and the learning and everything culminating that made it, you know, so important and that you're so proud of it? Uh, it's it's everything, especially the fact that I did it with conjugate when everyone said it didn't work. So I proved them wrong. But even if it did come a little bit easier, because I do have a benchers build at the end mm -hmm. of the day, but not a perfect benchers build. I would say I'm actually more built for the squat, if anything. Okay. Yet it's not my best lift because I intentionally neglected it. Actually, I have um, my ape index is like five, seven and a half. Yet my height is five foot five. So I have a positive ape index. What's know, that index? Makes I'm, not, I'm not familiar with it. So it's when your arms are out to the side like this, mm. right? But it, 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 you're... Your width compared to your, so your horizontal distance versus your vertical distance, which determines like, you know, how long you, your arms are in relation to the rest of your body, how proportional you are. Okay. So like yeah. someone who's really good at deadlifting will have a, like a, a plus five ape index or something. Their hands are so low, right? Okay. So mine is like a, like a plus two or whatever, which, which should indicate that I'm not, I'm not a pure bench tank. I'm close, mm -hmm. but I'm not like some guys is one to one. Like their, their arm length is the same as their height you know and they, and you see it they're very stubby looking like for, when you look at my upper body i don't look stubby not at all but stubby is my legs and that's why i tell you i'm actually built for the squat and so i would say with slightly above average uh benching genetics like leverages wise because i'm not perfect it's uh it's a damn good achievement and and if people still want to bring up the leverage thing well guess what i did it at 185 yeah so I mean, it just gets respect, period, you know? But easy or not, 405 is 405. I, I respect anyone who's done it. Like, my, my friend did it at 260, but Natty. And I saw him go from two plates to four plates. I mean, I don't care. I don't care what you weigh. I don't care how you did it. As long as you did it, Natty, you get my respect. Awesome. So you once said uh, that what you wanted to do was create masterpieces that stand the test of time, and people will go back to it for years. So I'm curious, are there any videos or topics that you've covered that when you've looked back, you're like, this is awesome advice? Yeah, um, particularly the videos that I've scripted. So I do a bit of a mixture. Some stuff is more outlined and I just speak at the top of my head. Other times it's like an essay from start to finish, like a 5,000 word piece, you know? Those videos are always perfect and they really do stand the test of time. They'll be relevant now and in five years, you know? Uh, and a lot of those have actually gone viral. For example, like my, my conjugate video that was scripted. I had to make it scripted because I'm, I'm covering very touchy subjects here, you know, with percentages mm -hmm. and exercise variations, uh, you know, it might not have been my most popular video, but it's something that I'm proud of. And at the end of the day, that's what I want to release Agreed. videos. That's like, I can sleep well at night and I don't have to recover them again. Like when I repeat myself, oftentimes it's because I could have done a better job the first time. So if you do it right once, then the need to repeat is lessened. You can do it every couple of years or whatever. It doesn't have to be every couple of months. Like you see some guys doing, right? Because you already address it all. Like I like making guides, you know? And um, I always say that my channel is like an old school MMORPG. Best example being RuneScape or World of Warcraft, right? You got guys that have been playing this since they're teenagers. And now they're in their 30s. They're still playing this damn game. Why? Because these games were made right. They were they were built to last. You know, they they, they factored in, you know, our, our addictive little habits and they built a good lore around it. And they slowly, you know, developed these games to preserve the original core audience. And what you'll find with my channel is that a lot of people have been following my stuff since 2016. And that's when I had like 10,000 subscribers. So how could it be that from 100K to 400K, the same guys are still watching. Well, two reasons. One, they developed an attachment of sorts. I probably helped them through their novice phase and whatever, and they just never stopped watching me because why not? But secondly, when I give advice, it works. Yeah. Plain and simple. And they keep coming back for more because they know that I will not steer them in the wrong direction. If I was full of shit, my YouTube channel would have been filtered out years ago. I would have never lasted this long and I have been making videos for 10 years now. So the reason why I'm still here is because people recognize that I'm the real deal. 
I'm not trying to be an egotistical maniac by saying this, but it's true. If you follow my advice, you watch my videos, you know, especially in the last three, four years, you're going to go very far. You can match my physique, surpass it, get close to it. The potential is incredible. And I wish I had this information sooner. So what I'm saying is as long as you have the purest intentions and you make videos that are built to last, that people can scroll down your page and, oh, that's all relevant. It helps you and it helps them. I also feel like you sometimes are willing to make harder content. Um, and that's not to blast anyone who makes a lot of like reactionary videos, but it feels like that's not your go-to. You're more trying to create these guides and these things that are kind of timeless. Oh, yeah. When something like a reaction, it's cool in the moment, but no one's going to watch that three months from now because it's more That's entertainment. Strong. It doesn't provide value as much. Not saying it can't provide value, but it's it's kind of a different modality than creating you you're, know things like guides. You're 100% right. It's like a week later, people forget, including for a very important use. Like just look at you know bodybuilders who died. You see them all over Instagram and YouTube for one to two weeks, and then you don't hear their name ever again. Yeah. Or if you do, it's rare. You're quickly forgotten. But if you have the right intentions, it's kind of hard to forget about you. Mm -hmm. And I would also say that, you know, regardless if it's negative or positive news, people don't care. People are moving on with their lives. They're going to do what they got to do. There's always something new. There's always a cool kid that just showed up. And, uh, you know, you got to be relevant by making content that will last, yeah. not just stuff that, you know, is relevant in 2024. Like if I start talking about home workouts, but I phrase it like a, a like a doom, if I upload a doomsday home workout, okay, it's probably not going to do that well today. Yeah. But if I were to upload that same video in 2020, uh, you know, it's the video. five times the views, right? right? So there's, there's a time and place for that kind of stuff. You know, like when people are all on a subject, you can come in, but it doesn't have to be a reaction. It could be your own take on it. Very neutral. You're not addressing anyone's name. You're just addressing the arguments. And that is what I like to do. You know, even though I don't talk about people directly, unless forced to, I actually have, <laughs> I've talked about their arguments. Sure. You know? And anyone who's familiar with the opposing side will we'll see that. that I am well-versed. Mm -hmm. So I am aware. I'm not this delusional guy who's just keeping to myself. As I mentioned earlier, I'm subscribed to various channels. And if you go on my Instagram page, I'm only following fitness stuff. That's the only thing I use it for. And if I was not a fitness influencer, I wouldn't even have social media. So the only reason why I use social media is to stay in touch, see what people are talking about. How can I improve upon this information? How can I add to the discussion? while doing it in a non-dramatic way. And I have no intentions of, you know, responding to anybody unless people really did want that. And I can do it. I don't know, in a fun, but even then it's like, what's the benefit? I just want guys who are here for gains. who are going to roll with me long-term like those old school MMORPGs. I don't care about anything else. I'm building a brand. I'm building longevity, you know, because the, the, the natty lifting game is slow and long-term. So yeah, I think that should be reflected in the content as well. Yeah. So back to uh, World of Warcraft. Uh, oh, yeah. I think a big part of it for me is it was the first game where I saw like Dungeon Finder. And I remember before <laughs> that, when I used to play Diablo and stuff, we used to like run around and be like, you want to be in my party? And then Dungeon mm -hmm. Finder came out and it was just like, yep. they just improved the experience so much. And then I had to delete the game at some point because it became too much. Everybody like, does. For most people, right? So. <laughs> And uh, fact or fiction, you had a you had a gaming channel at one point on YouTube. I did, crazy enough. And I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I regret stopping it because that channel probably would have had over 100k followers by now. It was it actually did pretty well for the time. I had around 5,000 followers. You know, not bad considering I didn't put much effort into it. That's but the weird. thing with gaming is that I don't really have time for it. Like I have about 50 games sitting in my collection, and I haven't played a single one of them. They're just waiting. <sighs> And I would love to, because I am a gamer at heart, but I feel like the only way I can get away with that is by reviving that gaming channel. Because I, I have to use my time wisely. If I'm, not, if, not, if I'm not building, it's because I work all day. I train, I'm editing, I'm filming, I'm doing all this stuff. Not to mention, you know, personal stuff as well. And then at nighttime, I'm reading, I'm writing. So it's like, 
when the hell do I have time to game? I don't. I maybe have one to two hours a week if I'm lucky. And even then it's like, maybe I have better things to do. So it's, just, I it's priorities, look. right? Like I always find, like I always say, I'm going to watch a movie or play games. And then I end up just like learning something on YouTube or going down yeah. some rabbit hole. And I'm like, my wife would be like, what just happened today? And I'm like, what did you watch? And I'm like, no, I spent four hours on this random topic. He's <laughs> like, oh. exactly. And it's yeah. just, that, that's just the priority. And I don't know why it is. It's, it's just, it's, that's the evolution. Yeah, it's priorities. And, uh, you know, as you get older, you realize certain things are more important and those games will always be there. Like I said to you before, um, between 2013 and 2016, I didn't do any gaming, you know, except for the occasional Counter-Strike here and there, but I, I barely played anything. But then I remember I, I literally, I went on Craigslist and I met up with a random guy and I bought like all the games that had come out in that three-year time frame. And I just binge played them for two months, got it out of my system. And then I went back to making content for the next couple of years. So it's not a regular thing. When I, when I enjoy it, it's great. It's like, okay, go all in. But I know that when I jump on those games, cause the addict is still in me, my, the rest of my life is taking a hit. Like when I, when I discovered the Yakuza series in 2018, I played through all of them within uh, not even a month. You know, it was like 80 hours of gameplay. I just banged through it. And you saw it on my channel. I was uploading Q and a once a week. It was very short term. And I was going through some things in that year, but you know, that's what I do. I binge the games, I get them out of my system and then I go back to doing real shit. But me trying to combine it with my productive I lifestyle, I, I can't do it. We yeah, got too I, many things to do. I bought the new Baldur's Gate and played it for three weeks and then I had to delete it. <laughs> that's what ends up happening. Yeah. I go from like, and the day I delete it is like the day it's, that it's I done, played yeah. 16 hours because I leveled and then that dopamine hits out there. I'm just like, what's the next level? I'm like, oh, the gaming addict's coming back. Like I have to delete. Yeah. Man, that, that's really, it is what it is. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw some pictures on the screen. Uh, for the first view here, just tell me something you learned from the person and what you would train with them if you met them in person. Mm. Cool? Sure. First one is uh, Mike uh, the Machine. Mike, Mike the Machine, Bruce. So... I learned a lot about neck training from him. In fact, I probably wouldn't be here were it not for his guidance. I have interviewed him twice. We've had some, uh, you know, personal communication for a number of years now. And uh, he actually inspired me to do a lot of those overloading movements. Like the rack pulls above the knee, he had done 1,500 pounds. Wow. Like 10 years before I did. You know what I'm saying? I didn't do 1,500. I did uh, 1140. But still... Uh, He's the OG when it comes to that stuff. He did a 300 pound neck extension for, I believe, two reps. He broke the, power shrugs. Broke the harness, right? He broke the harness, got a concussion. You know, the bridging stuff, the, the power shrugs, like everything. Like, he even had a DVD, TNT neck training. Look at my 2016 content, and you'll be like, oh, that kind of looks like uh, Mike's stuff, you know? And uh, I, I got sponsored by Netflix uh, because of him as well. So I credit a lot of my success to this man, you know, in terms of, you know, the exercises, uh, life philosophy as well. He had a, like a man up series that that's a real man right there. So if people want to learn more, they should check out my two interviews that I did with him. All right. Next one here. Leroy Colbert. Leroy Colbert. You see what I was saying before about the silver era? You see guys who look like that today, Natty? He would oh, win yeah. a WMBF competition. Okay. And this was in the 1950s, I believe. First man in the world to build 21 inch arms. Look at that vacuum. You know, he was doing 90 pound dumbbell curls. You know, he benched four or five as well. He was, uh, he, he said the wide grip, uh, wide grip pull ups were the number one mass builder. The dumbbell pullover was amazing. You know, the barbell back, the barbell back squat was unbeatable because that's all they did back then. You know, all of his advice is timeless and everything. Like even when I questioned him, uh, years later, I would go back to his advice and uh, it's never failed me once. Leroy Colbert had 70 years of lifting experience. 70. That's a lot. He was the oldest YouTuber <laughs> in the fitness world. You can't beat that. You know, the full body workouts. Guess what? People are talking about that too now to reduce fatigue. You know, he was so spot on. And... Um, you know, I watched him when he was alive. I remember when he passed away. I even made a video, rest in peace, you know. 
that that's that's a man of wisdom and uh you know he he's it's because of him that i learned about all these old school lifters because he was the only one that was making content on youtube on the mr yorkie lover channel so, so that got me down the rabbit hole 80s too right he was 81 years old with arms bigger than me so and no trt either so that i think that's a testament to what could be done naturally yeah all right. Next one is uh, John Grimick. Picture of you. John Grimick. He hasn't really impacted my my life that much. Uh, it's just more so an aesthetic uh, ideal. Like he has like that, like that tough, bare mode silver era look. You know. What, what would you and train would with him then? How would I train with him? I would do overloading stuff because he was doing uh, like a thousand pound pin press holds. Like he was lifting very very heavy weights. Uh, he used a chest expander as well. So a lot of like, he was a tank of a man, you know, uh, heavy lifting, but I, I look at him more like an aesthetic ideal rather than an inspiration. Cool. How about this book, oh. the book of methods by Louis Simmons? What's the yeah, impact? I read that there? book over and over again. So I remember I read that book on the bus and cause my, I remember people kept talking trash about Louis Simmons saying that his methods didn't work for raw lifters because keep in mind when I started coming up, it was during the time where guys are transitioning to more linear ways of training, right? It was like a backlash against West side and there were articles coming out like West of West side and all these things, you know, and I, and I can see what they were saying, but they were also straw manning his position. And I, I realized that very quickly when I read his actual book, that's why I always say, go to the damn source. Mm -hmm. Stop looking at what other people are saying about another man. So I read Louis's book. I read all his books. I bought them all. And it completely revolutionized my life. Like I got a four or five bench because of the West side system. Well, not West side, but the conjugate system. Okay. Uh, you know, about the max effort method, rotating exercises to prevent overuse and the law of accommodation, the bands, the chains, uh, the overloads, the more or less weight, uh, everything. It's because of him. And I, and I applied it not to powerlifting, but even to calisthenics, the bodybuilding, you know, my naturally enhanced system was basically, West side with a yoke emphasis, if you really look at it. And then some silver arrow stuff mixed in too with the full body. But the upper the up the upper lower template is very similar to West Side, you know. So uh because of him, I discovered all the other guys as well, like Matt Winning. And uh, you know, this is the default method that I choose for strength development, general strength development, because I'm not a powerlifter, right? But whenever I coach anyone. If they tell me I want to get stronger, I'm putting them on a conjugate program. That is, it's, it's going to be my default. You know, that or more of the way that I'm training now with the two set stuff, a bit more movements, a focus on progression, stuff like that. But uh, cool. Louis Simmons is the GOAT. That was, uh, you know, but I'll say I wasn't surprised when he when he passed away that young. You know, he, he did <laughs> do a lot of damage to his body. So for sure. And you uh, got to interview Matt Winning. I did. And I met him in person as well. Actually, I'm going to say this and at uh, the Ohio, uh, well, the Arnold sports festival, you, you see some people in person and they're like, Oh, less impressive than I thought. Matt Wenning actually surprised me. He is a Titan. Okay. He is a big man. Like his videos do not do him justice. I think he needs to hire a different videographer. <laughs> uh, he's tall and jacked, but he's really jacked. Like he, he looks like a bodybuilder when you see him in person, he looks leaner too. So I was very, when I saw him in person, I was shocked. I'm like, holy crap, man. Uh, he's jacked up. And when you see his numbers, it makes sense. Being able to bench 600, squat 850, you know, it is what it is. And he did break world records. <laughs> All right. So this next one is an OG YouTuber. Just tell me what's the first thing that comes to mind when you see this here. Oh, okay. I like your list. That's that's basically my list right there. Okay. <laughs> well, Johnny Candido, uh, we go way back. Uh, we used to even, if you look at some of his 2016, 2017 videos, sometimes in the intro, it'll say dedicated to alpha destiny. Like if you watch his overhead right. press segment, you'll see it in the first five seconds, he mentions me. And we used to comment back and forth on each other's videos. You know, we've always had that acquaintance. I think I used to get on his nerves as well at the beginning because <laughs> I would write these like, these long paragraphs, these extremist statements, but we all, we always, uh, we're always chill with each other. We just like messing around, you know, great raw powerlifting advice. 
uh, a great figure for the natural community. Uh, I agree with a lot of his, you know, training and life philosophies as well. We've stayed in touch uh, for, you know, almost a decade by this point. Uh, amazing source. You can't go wrong with his information. Uh, Omar Isaf, yo, Omar has done a lot for me. I'm eternally grateful for his guidance, being able to train with him on multiple occasions and just developing a friendship of sort over the years. He is responsible for exploding my channel after I hit 20,000 followers. So I had done a video for him. He hit me up. I did a, like a yoke training guide. And I swear to God, after that video, I was getting like 10,000 followers a week on YouTube. Wow. Now, this would not happen today in 2024. Uh, the, the, the scene has changed. If you collab with someone, it's, it just doesn't work like that. But back then, if you collab with a big name, it made a difference. So he really skyrocketed. I, I gained about 50,000 followers just off that one video that I did with him, wow. which is like, that was wow. more than my entire channel at the time. And those followers stayed because they were serious naturals. So uh, Omar's a really good guy. He, he even paid for my hotel when I went in Toronto. He took care of me. Uh, he, he showed me to all the best places. Like he treated me like a king. And he's always been a, a super genuine guy and delivering amazing information for those who want, you know, solid uh, natty gains. So nothing but respect. Uh, Alan Thrall. Alan Thrall is the, the only guy who was able to teach me leg drive on the bench press. I struggled with it for years and, you know, I watched every tutorial and like the best benching tutorial I found was Dave Tate's bench press cure, but I still couldn't get that leg drive down. And I, I tried everything. And then I found Alan and I remember Omar spoke highly about him as well. And his tip, it was basically, he was saying that you want to use leg drive to get into your arch instead of the other way around. You know, like arching and then putting the leg drive. It's it's a subtle difference, but if you watch his guide, it just changed my perspective. And with that, my stability and tightness was enhanced. And I started noticing, uh, you know, just cleaner form on the bench, you know. And in general, his technique guides are among the best. They're very uh, starting strength inspired, but done so in a clearer way. And he's just a, a gr like a good general resource for learning uh, proper technique on the big bar mo movements. And, uh, you know, he's a family man, owns a successful gym, transitioned to natural bodybuilding, is very open-minded, is, is messing with our community as well. Uh, we follow each other. He's just uh, an overall solid guy. And uh, his videos stand the test of time. Like, they were done in a way, like we were discussing before, that they'll always be relevant, you know? Like, his, his older videos are some of his best. Uh, fitness FAQs. I'm going through every one of these guys. You're cool with that, right? I love it, man. That's great. Okay. Fitness FAQs. I started watching him at the start. You know, we, we were both young at the time. Crazy to think about it. But, uh, I learned a lot about calisthenics from him, like the advanced stuff. Like he, he provided the guidance that the New Yorkers weren't giving because the New York scene was all about just basic push-ups, pull-ups, and dips, and muscle-ups, just high reps, you know. It was a street way of working out. But Daniel introduced me to the gymnastic rings, and so I bought a pair because of him, and that revolutionized everything with the amount of variations that you could do, like the pelican curls and, you know, so many variations. He even has a guy, he has a, a course that you can buy which shows all this stuff. But I would say I learned about exercise selection and injury prevention in a calisthenics context because of him, because his background is also with physiotherapy, you know? Uh, and he's always been like a calm, calm, cool, collected badass who did his own thing. He never focused on drama. It was about the long-term vision. And uh, I, I feel like our approach to making videos is very similar, just that he does it in an even more professional way, you know? So I respect that. I respect his work ethic. I respect you know, his general approach, the training, he even combines uh, weights in some contexts. He's just, uh, you know, a critical thinker who shows what could be done with bodyweight training, like at a very high level. So I respect that. Team 3D Alpha. I discovered him through uh, Physiques of Greatness. 
in maybe 2011. They had done a collab workout together with this other guy who had uh, longer hair. I believe his name was Matt. So then I started following him and uh, I immediately messed with his vibe. And uh, he's Haitian. So in Montreal, we have a lot of Haitians here. So mm -hmm. I was able to pick up on that vibe right away. And Megan's just a fucking badass. Sorry for swearing. But well, the guess. Dragon Ball Z <laughs> emphasis, like we had a very similar like upbringing of interests, you know? Oh. You, you know when you just click with someone like this? I, I like this guy. I always <laughs> felt that way about him. And I felt like he was a high performer as well because he was into self-improvement and he made a lot of videos, you know, in his car talking about a variety of subjects, how he likes to learn nonstop like uh, learning about like a historical event every day, a historical figure, you know, constantly reading uh, the emphasis on calisthenics, nucleus overload. I learned about that from him. So a lot of our training was overlapping at the time, like the, the full body, the overloads, you know, he was ahead of the game about a lot of these. In a way, you can say he was more science-based than a lot of people who call themselves science-based nowadays. Like, he was talking about he was he was just ahead of the game on every account and uh if you check out our interview that we did together in 2017 you'll you'll see why he's just a bookworm he he knows a lot of stuff and since then i, wa I watched it <laughs> he's, yeah awesome <laughs> but uh he's just a good dude overall um who's obsessed with learning and you know good character so uh now we got my man Brandon Carter so Brandon Carter, I've been following him since 2009. He was one of my original inspirations. I still follow him to this day. Uh, what's crazy is I saw him go from broke to rich. You know, he used to live in this like ghetto apartment and he would film with resistance bands. And he also uh, did like R&B songs, you know, so covers oh, yeah. of other. Yeah. So a lot of people don't know that, but I remember watching <laughs> I because I saw all of his content. He even had a. A video on his channel called the most interesting man in the world it was like a, a parody you know so i've been following brandon since he didn't even have ten thousand followers like we're talking the very very beginning and i remember when his first channel got deleted so i saw him restart it and then build up you know he was making videos at the park with uh seat belts to as a gymnastic ring replacement so he, he, he's doing dips at a children's park with seat belts wow. with his friend brian right and i just saw him level up and uh he was also an inspiration for reading because he would, that's what he loved to do. Right. He had this immense bookshelf and I listened to his recommendations. Like these are the books you got to read. Right. And yo, he really, he lived it. You saw him like become more knowledgeable, evolve his physique. Also natty, uh, just giving great advice, great workout advice, advice, great life advice. And we saw him rise to the top and now he's, he's absolutely killing it. So just, a, a, a person to look up to for gains and life, you know? Uh, now we got my man Vitruvian Physique. So it's funny, the, the first interaction I ever had with Vitruvian Physique was like a debate about full body workouts. That's how I discovered him. He made a video saying that it probably wasn't the best way to train. And he gave his reasons why. And I got, I'm like a young man who got all pissed off at that. I'm like, hey, but I, I train full body. And I'm like, uh, I'm bigger than you. I'm 182 at five foot five, so I got more muscle. And look, I, I bench more and all these things. And I just had this massive ego. So I came at him and, uh, you know, just responding to his points. And then he he did his response. And then I did another response. And that, that kind of settled it. But it was all fun, right? After that, uh, you know, I realized, like, I, I kind of misbehaved, you know? <laughs> And I remember talking to Omar Isaf <laughs> about this in person, like, yo, I probably should have, you know, approached that differently. And, uh, you know, started, uh, you know, I subscribed to him. I started watching his other content. I'm like, okay, he's a good guy. Like, I'm sorry for being a freaking asshole. And uh, over the years, I've, I've grown to really like his channel. Uh, actually, he inspired me to compete. Wow. So I watched him compete a couple of times. And uh, in his last classic physique competition, I'm like, yo, I got to do this too. So uh, full credit to Vitruvian Physique. I think he has an amazing natural physique. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he's a genuine guy, just like the rest of these people here. 
And uh, he inspired me to make some big moves. And you could even say that a lot of my 2023 20, growth was because of him. Because he inspired me, because he was the catalyst, a lot of my success came afterwards. And now we follow each other. We're cool. I think he's a good inspiration for young men. Okay. Got John Meadows over here. He was the first bodybuilder to apply conjugate training principles. And that's the main thing that I learned from him. Some guys will give the generic answer of uh, the Meadows row. I did those as well. Actually, I used to do like seven plate Meadows cheat rows. That definitely works for the upper back overload. And it's, it's genius because the landmine is a lengthened bias row. So that's the primary uh, benefit that uh, allows you to get a stimulus that's so potent without needing to spend $5,000 on a prime fitness machine. So John Meadows will save you money. <laughs> and like he discovered a biomechanically sound movement that's free weight based. Absolute genius for that. But the big thing that he was doing was attaching bands and chains to stable machines. If you look now on TikTok and a lot of social media platforms, you got people doing reverse banded hack squats, reverse banded Smith machine JM presses. So what they're doing is they're trying to match the leverages of a given movement to the muscle where it has the best leverage at a certain joint angle, right? So they use bands and chains to correct a strength curve deficit or just, you know, improve the lift overall. And John was the first bodybuilder to do this. So you see, he even had an elite FTS mountain dog pack. You know, he would train there often with Dave Tate. And, uh, you know, he just came up with a bunch of genius movements. And he was actually an original biomechanics guru, you could say. But he didn't even have explanations for it. <laughs> he just knew that they felt right. But then when you analyze the reasons why, they just made sense. Like the dual rope pushdowns, right? That's because of alignment. The single rope doesn't mm -hmm. accommodate how wide you are. Like if you're a big guy like John, you can't just use one rope, right? And the fact that with two, you can get that squeeze behind the body. Uh, braced curls. He's the first guy to do that. Doing uh, dumbbell curls on the lap pull down machine. And guess what? Guys don't give him credit either. So when it comes down to stability and resistance profiles for bodybuilding, he did it all. So he was a, a true thinker and experimenter. Now, we got my man, Eric Bugenhagen. So I discovered him in 2015, and he is responsible for me training like an absolute animal, <laughs> actually bringing back my love for heavy metal because I had gone through a period where I stopped listening to it. But because of him, like it just, I discovered so many great bands. And, you know, you can even say that I bought a home gym because of him, because I was inspired watching him train in his basement. And then his garage and all that, right? So the mindset, doing one rep maxes, screaming, going crazy, just lifting heavy. Uh, the attitude of just horse cocking weights, as he calls it. All credit, Derek Bugenhagen. And we actually did an interview <laughs> years ago. Um, we had to take it down because of the WWE. But okay. yeah, that, that was an OG segment. You know, I did it with my man, Phil. So Eric and I go way back. You know, uh, I everything that I know about that tough mindset, it, it comes from him. Like to this day, I still I still hone in on that like animalistic energy. And I enjoy uh, watching his videos to this day. You know, I've kept up with him over the years and uh, we've always uh, wished each other well. So great guy if you want to learn how to be hardcore. Now, Scott Herman Fitness. I've been watching him again since 2009. Same thing with Scooby. Um, he was actually my original aesthetic inspiration. I wanted to look like him when I was young. I, you know, I remember being the skinny gamer nerd playing World of Warcraft. And uh, like, that's the body. I was like, fuck, I got to look like Scott, you know? And he had the best tutorials on the internet at the time. I remember he had a video called My Chess Workout. <laughs> And that, that had millions of views even back then, which was a lot, you know, and he just, he, he always had these blue shorts on the same ones. I guess he was batch filming his videos, but, uh, he gave these thorough explanations, which was unseen at the time. And, uh, after having like this crazy exercise library, he started releasing like series of workout programs. Like he has so many of them. If you go on his site, muscularstrength.com. 
there, there must be like close to a hundred, right? So that's what, that's what he liked to do. He built workout series and then he would compare movements. What's better T-bar rows or barbar rows. So kind of like what I do, but with his little flair on it, you know? So he's an inspiration in terms of uh, physique, still natural, still natural, still looking amazing. Uh, the guy doesn't age, <laughs> you know, I think that's another benefit of staying natural. And uh, his, his content is timeless. Like every video you watch from the very beginning till now is relevant. So you just, you can't go wrong with any of this stuff. And he's also a, a genuine guy, you know? So uh, next we got Physiques of Greatness, Chris Jones. I discovered him in 2011 after he responded to a video by Ian McCarthy. That, that was the original optimal guy. So uh, Chris was, you know, sharing his take on, you know, why bro science might have its merits in certain cases. He was doing that video with Vince as well. So physiques of greatness, uh, I saw that come up, you know, from the very beginning. So I remember I, I was literally in high school when I started watching uh, <laughs> POG. And he was the only person alongside the Hodge twins where I would watch the vlogs. So I remember he would go to Denny's. Yeah. <laughs> he had the ghetto spatula. Like we're talking very early days of POG. And I watched every single video, you know, including leading up to the Beast Mode Jones channel. I actually bought his um, his stringers. You know, you could see it in some of my older videos, the POG tank tops. Nice. Real big fan, you know. And uh, we've it's it's what's cool is that with all these people here, I've got to interact with them over the years. Like they they inspired me, and now I'm talking to them in the DMs. You know, now we're friends, right? So Chris is a uh, and he's always shown me love. By the way, I remember when he got. He had a situation with Vince G, I think in 2014. And I, I defended Chris because I didn't agree with what Vince was doing. You know, he wasn't producing, but he was still taking all the money, you know? Mm. So I'm like, that's unacceptable. And I came in and I, and I shared my response. And uh, Chris uh, really appreciated that. And he's been a supporter of mine ever since. And he said, you're going to do big things, my man. He's like, I could see it. You're a true hustler. You'll see. And he was right. So he always believed in me from day one. Uh, I always believed in him too when I saw him come up, and uh, I mean it's it's always been a really good, you know, going back and forth with him. And then uh, we end off with M McAnimal, as I mentioned earlier, he was one of my calisthenics inspirations. So McAnimal, uh, so he he literally first of all I didn't realize how old he was, but he started training at like 25 years old. But again, the guy doesn't age, <laughs> so he's he's like damn near 40 at this point crazy you know he's becoming a, a street lifting champion uh, i love to see it i saw him you know he used to do like 50 pistol squats in one set you know he would do these extreme feats of strength these extreme jumps and uh he, he added a like a black panther kind of twist to the calisthenics world he was showing that it's not just about push-ups pull-ups and dips you can train your legs you can do rings you can do like a lot of these brute force lifts. He, he's basically a combination of fitness FAQs and the uh, New York scene from back then. And it, I okay. believe he actually live in New York as well. So that's kind of how he used to collab with those guys as well. But the difference is that he was willing to learn and improve upon those guys. He actually ended up beating those New Yorkers, you know, in terms yeah. of overall performance and just developing skills. So he's, I see him as someone as a learner, you know who never stops experimenting. And just like myself, he ended up using the conjugate system. He's in this for the long term. And he's just, uh, you know, he's someone who doesn't stop. He always says it's the mechanical way, you know? So I, I respect his work ethic. I think he has one of the best physiques around. Like, he would even do well in natural bodybuilding, if you ask me. He's just got that structure. So he's very smart. Uh, he's, not a, he's not afraid to try out different things. He's tough. Just a great inspiration overall for calisthenics and life. So that's wow. quite the list you got there. <laughs> uh, Alex, thanks for that masterclass on the OGs of YouTube. Um, it was great to hear kind of the character building moments there, but also just the inspiration and your passion for it. It's not just the passion for the content you make, but the passion for the community since day one is like very very clear. Thank you. 
I, um, I wasn't rambling too much. I'm no, not worried. at all. I have I have like 20 more questions, but we could save it for another day because I know we've had a long conversation. Oh, yeah, that might be a good idea. <laughs> uh, so Alex, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Hope you had a good time and where can everyone find you? I did have a good time. Thank you for having me on, Varun. It was a pleasure talking to you. Definitely got to do that part too. Um, if you guys want to learn more about me, best way is just on the Alex Leonidas YouTube channel alexleonidas.com or Alex Leonidas official. I'm basically the only guy with this name. So enjoy looking me up. I'm everywhere. All right. Thanks for your time, man. Thank you.